The second military techno technological revolution that would upend the arms trade and production system was the Industrial Revolution, or as some historians like to call it, the Steam and Steel Revolution. If you recall from the previous lecture, the gunpowder revolution was characterized by relatively low levels of trading and low levels of innovation. The trade in arms was largely curtailed by the state, and manufacturing processes ensured that innovation would, re would remain slow and incremental. While the Industrial Revolution threw a grenade both figuratively and literally into all of that, Manufacturing was now large-scale, utilizing techniques that not only sped up the rate of production, but also increased the power and lethality of armaments. Between 1858 and 1888, the whole nature of arms underwent its greatest period of revolutionary innovation since the development of gunpowder and cannon. Ships evolved from wind to steam power and wooden to iron. Rifled, breech-loading steel cannon were perfected, increasing their range accurately by over 300%. Breech-loading rifled firearms with an accurate range of 600 to 1,000 meters became the norm. This period importantly saw the rise of the private producer. Names that are synonymous with arms today like Krupp and Vickers and Armstrong took full advantage of the Industrial Revolution to build their industrial empires. State-imposed trade restrictions largely disappeared during most of the 1800s and even into the 1900s. England, for example, viewed arms exports as key to keeping its own domestic industries profitable and healthy. The state could benefit from new innovations from its domestic arms production without even having to foot the bill, and this looked really good to the government. Producers such as Vickers and Armstrong in England or Krupp, Krupp in Prussia also sought foreign sales for the simple fact that steel guns were expensive to produce and design, and R&D and unit costs had to be spread as widely as possible. Domestic financing was not seen and viable in the long term, and few states had enough capital or military size to absorb the excess capacity of the largest arms manufacturers. However, interestingly, Many arms purchases by nations were co-produced or licensed produced, and a shockingly small amount of arms would be exported directly from the country where the domestic industry like Krupp was actually based. States that may not have been able to innovate because of a lack of capital resources were able to at least enhance their own industrial capacity by paying for companies like Krupp to establish a factory to build military arms. States like Russia would approach Krupp and even ask for an entire factory to be based within Russia. Other countries like Japan would license the production and gain valuable experience in armaments manufacturing through building of foreign designs. Now, I would like to push against this commonly held assumption that the trade in arms during this period was laissez-faire. It was not. Governments still had to approve any export. But in their cost-benefit analysis, they felt that the trade in arms was more beneficial to the state than it was necessarily harmful. Increased export sales kept domestic firms profitable and domestic labor employed, which was good. Also, production lines for new arms would be kept open for a longer per period of time, decreasing the unit cost for domestic procurement. Innovation through research and development could be funded by export profits, keeping the domestic military at the tip of the spear. And lastly, few other states even possessed the expertise or capital to make similar weapons even if they wanted to. Therefore, they would be beholden to the exporting state for arms to begin with. They would never even prove to be any type of competition as far as the state saw it. The problem was, however, that during this period, it wasn't uncommon for an exporting state finding itself outgunned by other states using arms produced from their own industries. And it's undoubtedly true that the massive amount of exports during this period prepared the world and partially fueled the global conflict that was World War I. Looking at the period of the Industrial Revolution, let's go ahead and identify the major producers, the patterns of trade, innovation, and technological diffusion. Arms production during this period was diffuse, with many states acquiring the capability to manufacture arms under license or co-production. This large diffusion gives rise to the tiered arms production analysis. 
first tier arms producers during this period were largely based out of Britain, Germany, and France. These companies produced the most sought after technologically advanced arms. Second tier arms producers in this period were states that could produce license arms and even innovate those arms to fit their own environments, such as Japan, Russia, and Italy. Third tier arms produ producers could produce licensed copies of arms, <coughs> excuse me, but did not have the capacity to innovate on any design. States such as China and Turkey could be considered or during this period a third tier arms producer. Now trade during this period was high, especially when it's compared with the gunpowder revolution before it. Countries would trade arms to establish alliances, but most of the trade during this period came in the form of co-production and license production. States that could not produce their own arms did not want to be beholden to another state for all of its military arms. So the strategy at that point in time was to pay a foreign state that possesses a company like Krupp to establish a factory in the importing country to produce arms and then teach its own workers how to produce those arms. Now, how did innovation and diffusion occur? Well, as I had touched upon previously, the large-scale establishment of co-production and license production supercharged diffusion throughout the system. However, innovation remained in the hands of a relative few. States that possessed the capital, both educationally and financially, would and could innovate. But the innovation in arms largely came from the private firms based within the state, which used foreign funding from trade to fund that innovation. Therefore, much of the innovation was spurred by private firm competition with one another. The Industrial Revolution placed states in stark contrast with one another in regard to armament production capability. Armaments during this period had become increasingly complex and expensive to the point where even states that had the ability to produce and to export, like Italy, were increasingly being relegated to second or third tier producing states. Arms production, especially at the cutting edge, was incredibly expensive and becoming the purview of only the few richest states. And this would continue to be exacerbated into the next military technical revolution that would precede World War II.